lung ultrasound for triage within TIC-19. My name's Joe Noonan. I'm the ultrasound fellow in the acute medical unit at the Royal Berkshire Hospital. At the Royal Berks, we've developed a triage pathway for patients with COVID. It's called TIC-19. And this video is for those of our colleagues learning lung ultrasound as part of our TIC-19 pathway. There are three parts to the learning session we run at the Royal Barks. The first is the theory part, and that's what's contained within this YouTube video. Then we scan some models, normally PA students or medical students, to get an idea of what normal looks like on lung ultrasound. And then we look at some pathology using Bodyworks EVE 2, which is our ultrasound sim. And we look at some scans of patients we've scanned who have had COVID. So that's me in the middle. And on the left is Andy Walden, my boss. He's an AMU and ICU consultant and really the strategist behind TIC-19. I'm more the tactician. I like the details. And on the right, that's Dave Clark. He's an ED consultant who's integrated this TIC-19 pathway into the emergency department at the Royal Barks. But so many people at the Royal Barks have helped us with this triage pathway. So that's why the Royal Barks is up there at the top. Several weeks ago, it feels like a, a lifetime ago now, how the landscape's changed in such a short length of time. Andy and I received a load of documents from Cristiano Parani, that's him, an Italian emergency medicine physician in Brescia. Now, at the time, Brescia was the second hotspot for COVID in Europe. Amongst all the documents that Cristiano sent us was a triage pathway. We had it translated into English by two Italian midwives. We modified it, put it through clinical governance in the acute medical unit and the emergency department here at the Royal Barks, and what came out was TIC-19 which included a way to send patients home, as they were doing in Italy, with a SATS probe, and then we phoned them daily. This creates a sort of virtual ward of patients out there in the community. But to be able to use this triage pathway, you need to be able to either have access to chest X-ray or be able to do lung ultrasound. So this is all about teaching lung ultrasound, the COVID within tick 19. So let's begin. It used to be thought that you couldn't ultrasound scan lung and the reason for this was if you looked at the heart for instance with an ultrasound probe you'd see something that looks like heart and if you look at the liver it looks like liver that's to say it's anatomical it looks anatomical. If you look at the lung all you see is artifact and the reason for that is because air is the enemy of ultrasound. But this guy, Daniel Lichtenstein, a French intensivist, he discovered that that artifact can give you a lot of crucial information. So although ultrasound scatters when it hits the lung, we can still derive information from the different types of artifact. Well, if you're an enthusiast like me, this is the Bible of lung ultrasound. This is Lichtenstein's seminal book. And the key paper in this is from 2008. And in that paper, he describes how with a 90.5% accuracy, he can diagnose the cause of the acute shortness of breath in a patient. So it's been known for a long time that lung ultrasound is very useful in diagnosing acute shortness of breath and probably more useful than chest x-ray in many cases. And then COVID came along, and that's increased interest in lung ultrasound again. So this paper on the right is very interesting. It showed that only 54% of patients with non-severe COVID had abnormal chest x-rays, which is quite a low number if you think about it. And then the paper on the left is also another Chinese paper and they describe something that I think is worth noting. If I just quote them, they say, 
Lung ultrasonography gives the results that are similar to chest CT and superior to standard chest radiography for evaluation of pneumonia and or ARDS, with the added advantage of ease of use at point of care, repeatability, absence of radiation exposure and low cost. So what they're talking about is how CT is actually quite impractical for all the patients that are coming through, even though CT is the gold standard. And that chest x-ray misses a lot of the subtle changes that would be seen on CT. Then this Italian paper describes how lung ultrasound can be used at every stage of the patient's journey, right from triage to the A&E to the in-hospital stage to ICU. So back to tick 19 then. If the patient has abnormal SATs, then they're coming into hospital. And if the patient has normal SATs but fails their walking test, then they're coming into hospital. But if they've got normal SATs and a negative rapid walking test, and their imaging, so chest x-ray or lung ultrasound, is abnormal, swab the patient, give them oral antibiotics to cover for CAP, and then refer them to the ambulatory COVID clinic. If they've got normal SATs and a negative rapid walking test with normal imaging, potentially these patients can just go home with appropriate safety netting. If, however, you have clinical concern or you think they're at high risk of deteriorating, then these are patients that you can also refer to the ambulatory COVID clinic. At the Royal Barks, we use mainly two different ultrasound devices for lung ultrasound. The GE Venue, which produces really beautiful crisp images, but is quite expensive and rather difficult to clean between patients. And the less expensive Butterfly, which doesn't produce quite as nice images, but is really easy to clean. Here's a video showing the Butterfly's capabilities. So a bit about ultrasound physics. Sound is all about waves and one cycle per second is one hertz. Two cycles per second is two hertz. The human ear can hear anything between 20 and 20,000 cycles per second. Ultrasound is anything above that frequency. So what we can hear anything above that that's ultrasound medical ultrasound uses frequencies between 1 and 20 megahertz that's 1 million of those cycles in a second to 20 million of those cycles in a second so if a boat has a radar it can send out an ultrasound pulse and then wait for it to come back. 
And if we know the speed of the ultrasound in that medium, in this case the water, and we know the time that it took for the ultrasound pulse to be emitted and for it to be received again, we can work out the distance that the seabed is away from the boat. And that's what happens with medical ultrasound too. An electric current goes through the ultrasound probe, which is on the left of the screen, and tiny crystals called piezoelectric crystals change shape and emit ultrasound. The sound is represented by the red wave. Well, it hits the blue object and some of it bounces back. And the clever thing is that the ultrasound probe is now able to turn the ultrasound back into an electrical current. And if we know, as I said in the previous slide, the speed of the ultrasound in that medium, we can see on the screen the blue object as a dot a certain distance away from the ultrasound probe. So if you're in a cave and you shout, the sound wave goes through the air, it hits the cave wall, and then you hear it coming back. And what happens here is that the rock has a different density, so you get what I call bounce back. And the same thing happens in the human body, and particularly with the lung, bounce back is really important. The greater the difference in the density, the greater the bounce back. That's a little bit simplified, but I think it gets the point across. Ultrasound probes come in all shapes and sizes, but the key ones to know about are these three. The linear probe, which is good for putting in cannulas, for instance, because it's a higher frequency, so it has a shallower depth. The phased array, which is used for echo, that's to say ultrasound of the heart. It's good at getting through the narrow gap between the ribs. And the curvilinear, and that's the one we're interested in for lung ultrasound. However, then the butterfly came along and it has one probe head. And with that one probe head, it can do all of these three things, which is pretty clever. Furthermore, as you will see in the video in the next slide, it doesn't use piezoelectric crystals, it uses little tiny drums. The significance of taking an ultrasound machine and pushing it onto a chip is first and foremost about cost. We are able to make ultrasound machines much more accessible than they've ever been before because we leverage this sophisticated, inexpensive, high-performance supply chain that has fueled the consumer electronics revolution. And we're able to exploit some tremendous performance benefits to making ultrasound machines on this semiconductor platform. We can engineer these chips to have a much wider bandwidth than a traditional piezoelectric transducer, and that means that we have one probe that can look anywhere inside the body. We're actually able to not just put transducers on these chips, but a lot of signal processing and computational horsepower. And that means that we can do advanced signal processing techniques that you wouldn't otherwise get unless you paid way over $100,000 for an ultrasound machine. And we can show you that image on an iPhone. The way these chips are made is they start out with these large circular disks. We figured out how to etch almost 100 ultrasound machines onto one of these large circular disks. And these disks, are run through hundreds of processes in incredibly complex, sophisticated factories that already exist. The same factories that are being used to produce the chips in your iPhone, the chips in your computer, the sensor for your digital camera. We use that supply chain and we use it to make a life-saving ultrasound machine. That little rectangular chip is the ultrasound machine. It has over 9,000 little drums on it that wobble to create sound and then receive it from the body. It does the computation to render an image. And when you look at our probe, the very front behind the lens is that chip. So there are two key buttons that you need to know about so you can get scanning. On the older machines, they were somewhat hidden amongst all these other buttons. 
It's made easier for us with the butterfly. Depth is really important for lung ultrasound. Lichtenstein recommends about 13 centimetres, that being a good depth. But if the patient is larger, you might need to go for a, a, a greater depth. And on the butterfly, you just swipe up or down to change the depth on the phone or tablet screen. Brightness is really important too. So to change the brightness on the butterfly, just swipe left and right on the tablet or phone screen. When you're scanning, remember that you're seeing a slice through the patient. And that can take a bit of getting used to until you orientate yourself. But it's like driving, it will become easier the more you do. Lichtenstein, who I mentioned at the beginning, described these, what he called, blue points, which are a bit like where you listen with a stethoscope. There are two anterior blue points and one at the side or the back of the chest. Well, we've modified this because with COVID, it tends to affect the lung bases in the back of the lung, so we needed to include that. So we've got a 12-point scan.